thank you. And let me thank also the organizers for the invitation to speak at this very nice conference. So today I want to tell you about some work that I've done in collaboration with uh, Sibylle Driesen, uh, who is in Santiago, and also together with uh, uh, Luis Miramontes, the first paper, and uh, Juan Miguel Nieto and Leander Gis, the second one. So uh, let me say that uh, I will not go into many details during, during this talk, but of course you are uh, welcome to, to ask me questions. So I would like to start with this uh, sketch that summarizes uh, the, the main message of my talk. So I will uh, deal with nonlinear sigma models. So I will have maps from a two-dimensional worksheet that I will take to be a cylinder to some target space that I will take to be uh, to have some uh, isometries encoded in a Lie group that I will call G. So you can have in mind for concrete examples, the principal car model, symmetric cosets, super cosets. So for these models, I will take periodic boundary conditions on the worksheet. And uh, you can think of them as being a parent model. I will call them undeformed because I will have a procedure. It's called the uh, Ian-Baxter deformation that preserves integrability and generates uh, new uh, integrable models uh, that I will call deformed. So in, in this case, deformation, uh, among other things, also means that uh, you are deforming the target space geometry. So here I'm trying to represent it as going from a round sphere to a squashed sphere. And for these deformed models, I still want to take periodic boundary conditions on the worksheet. The main message of my talk is that these deformed models with periodic boundary conditions are equivalent to undeformed models. So here I'm back to the round sphere in target space, but with twisted boundary conditions on the worksheet. So if my fields are encoded in a group element, G, G evaluated at sigma is equal to two pi is not anymore equal to sigma evaluated at zero. They, are, they will be related in a way that I will show you in a moment. So you can imagine that you're taking the cylinder of the worksheet, you cut it along this red line, and then you glue it back together in a non-trivial way. So let me give you uh, some motivations to, uh, to look at these integrable deformations. Uh, first of all, uh, Integrable models are precious. With them, we can calculate many things, but they're also rare. So it's natural to try to generate new integrable models uh, when we start uh, from other known ones. And then with this business of integrable deformations, an, an interesting point is that uh, we can retain the power of integrability while at the same time breaking some manifest symmetries like isometries or even super isometries of your models. And the idea actually is that uh, these manifest symmetries are not just broken, they are normally converted into some hidden symmetries uh, that you always encounter in uh, integrable models. So that's one, perhaps one way to try to understand the role of hidden symmetries in this context. One of my motivations actually is the ADCFT correspondence uh, because, uh, well, uh, first of all, this relates certain Superstream backgrounds, for example, the ADS5 S5 one. In this case, it would be dual to n equals four of AM means. And in certain examples of ADSFT dualities, one can identify a common integrable structure. So, a very interesting question is uh, to ask whether it's possible to deform that. So, this will connect to other topics in theoretical physics, like, for example, the generation of new supergravity backgrounds that are deformations of ADS5-S5 or deformations of n equals 4 superior mills. And the deformations uh, of which I will tell you uh, today are uh, conjectured to be related to non-commutative gauge theories that are deformations of n equals 4. So the program of uh, the application of the integrability methods to the spectral problem uh, that was so successful in this undeformed setup is not still uh, completely developed in the case of the deformations. As I will tell you today, we have a quite solid, underst solid understanding regarding the classical integrability part of the string sigma model. I will tell you about uh, the lapse connection and the construction of the classical spectral curve. And it would be very interesting to extend this to, to the full story. So I would, I would like to have in mind as a prototype example of deformation, the case of TST deformations, because the, these are a subclass, it turns out, of the Jan-Baxter deformations that we consider. 
You can, uh, you can do a PST anytime you have two commuting isometries in your parent model. Here I want to implement them as shifts of fields X1 and X2. And then you obtain the TST by the chain of uh, T duality on X1, a shift of X2 by something proportional to eta, that will be my deformation parameter. And finally, another uh, T duality along X1. So when you do this, you obtain a new deformed model, a deformed sigma model. So here I'm drawing this quashed sphere. And this deformation parameter will appear explicitly in your background fields. And obviously also when you compute the equations of motion of, of the sigma model, they will depend explicitly on eta. But the non-trivial uh, point is that it's possible to implement a non-local theory definition on the worksheet. I write here the formula in gray. It's not, the details are not important. What is important is that under this no local theory definition, the eta dependence at the level of the equations of motion is completely reabsorbed. So what you get are the equations of motion of the undeformed sigma model. However, because of the no locality of the relation, if you start with periodic boundary conditions for the deformed model, you conclude that you will have twisted boundary conditions for the undeformed one, which is on shell equivalent to it. Uh, I want to stress this on shell equivalence just means that uh, they are related at the level of the equation of motion, as I just said. So my X tilde coordinates evaluated at two, uh, two pi will not be equal to X tilde evaluated at zero, but I will have an offset dictated by some Q1 and Q2 that in this case are just uh, uh, neutral charges cor corresponding to the U1 isometries that I'm using to generate the deformation. So for young Baxter deformations, the setup will be similar. It will be a generalization because the relation among the fields uh, to implement the twisted boundary conditions will be nonlinear. And that will be a consequence of the fact that these Yambaxa deformations exploit a non-abelian algebra of isometries in general. So we'd like to jump immediately to this twisted picture, even before introducing the uh, definition of the Yambaxa deformation so that you already know what to expect. Uh, let me say that in this talk, I will only consider the example of the principal current model. If you have motivations in ADCFT, you probably want to consider uh, super cosets. Uh, but this would introduce additional technical details that I don't want to have in my talk. So let me take the principal current model. When we compute uh, the equations of motion, we know that we must uh, check that some boundary terms vanish. So in particular, in this case, I want this guy to be periodic. And of course, uh, to achieve this, I could just take uh, G, my Lie group element, to be periodic. But here I want to uh, generalize this. And in particular, I will take it to have a left twist. So I take a constant element of the Lie group, I call it W, and G will satisfy these twisted boundary conditions from the left. So this is the kind of uh, twist uh, that, uh, that I will have also later. Now, notice that. Uh, the physically inequivalent twists that you can write are not given by the all possible elements of your Lie group that you are considering, because you can always do theory definitions that obviously leave the, the physics invariant. So in particular, what I can do is to do a left transformation of my group element by a constant element of G, and then my twist will transform by uh, the corresponding adjoint action. So this is enough to conclude that the physically inequivalent twists will be given by the adjoint orbits of the Lie group that you're considering. And then, well, if you consider uh, compact Lie groups, you immediately conclude that uh, you can take this W to be the exponential of something in the Cartan. But if you work with non-compact algebras, which are actually relevant in the context of ADCFT, you can have even more complicated cases because you can have also non-diagonalizable twists. So for young Baxter deformations, uh, uh, we will see that uh, we can revive them in an equivalent way as a twisted PCM. But there's an additional feature for young Baxter because the twist will be written in terms of conserved charges. So it will not be a generic constant element of G, but it will depend on, it, on the dynamics because the conserved charges will take different values depending on the uh, classical solution on which they are evaluated. So let's finally come to this definition of what is a Yambaxa deformation. As I already said, I'm doing it only in the case of the principal current model. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm taking the action of the 
you know, of the principal car model, and I'm sticking in the middle this inverse of an operator O, which is a linear operator on the Lie algebra, that I define as the identity minus eta R. So eta is again my deformation parameter, and R is an operator, a linear operator on the Lie algebra that I will call the R matrix. One reason why I can call it the R matrix is simply that if I choose a basis for my Lie algebra, then the action of R is encoded into these components R A B of this matrix, okay? You probably remember uh, the principal car model has two copies of G isometries, uh, left and the right copy. And the deformation that I'm writing here leaves the right copy unbroken. It's uh, immediate to see. While the left copy is generically broken to a subgroup, which corresponds to the group of transformations for which the adjoint action commutes with this R operator. So in general, this breaking of isometries uh, will give you, uh, it, it signals uh, the presence of the deformation. Of course, if I, if I write such a deformation, such a deformed action, will not, it will not in general preserve integrability. I will have to impose some additional properties, in particular two properties for R, in order to preserve integrability when I switch on the deformation parameter eta. The first property is that R should be anti-symmetric in this sense with respect to the bilinear form that uh, you have on the Lie algebra. And the second one is the property that gives a name to this family of deformations. R should satisfy the classical Jan-Baxter equation. So this is a quadratic equation that I'm writing here that R should satisfy on the whole Lie algebra. If you follow the talk by Fiona uh, last week, you probably remember that on the right-hand side, she had also something else. So uh, here I'm setting her parameter C to be equal to zero. So I'm focusing only on the class of homogeneous Jan-Baxter deformations. And for that reason, I'm not considering the case of quantum group deformations, but of twists of the integrable model. Maybe for some people, this is not obvious that this is the classic Jan-Baxter equation. We are used to an equation of this type, but uh, let me say that uh, it's possible to introduce an object uh, small r that satisfies this equation if you just use these components r, a, b of this r matrix, uh, contract them with the t, a, uh, wedge, t, b, the generators of, uh, of your Lie algebra. So let me... Uh, let me uh, mention a couple of examples of solutions of the classic Jan-Baxter equation written in this form. And let's do it in the simplest possible setup, the minimal case of rank two. So R is equal to T1 wedge T2. The simplest possible solution is in the class of abelian R matrices. So in this case, T1 and T2 will be commuting. And it turns out that uh, these abelian solutions uh, are essentially uh, TST deformations in disguise. Even more, if you consider the case of compact Lie algebras, uh, only abelian solutions of the classical Jan-Baxter equations are allowed. And these uh, generators T1 and T2 will be in the cartan. So this should ring a bell with what I said before regarding the allowed twists uh, in the case of compact, uh, compact Lie groups. If you want more complicated solutions, uh, if you want non-abelian solutions, you have to uh, now impose the equation on uh, non-compact algebras, and then more possibilities are allowed. For example, in this rank two case, I have this possibility that is called Jordanian deformation and that uh, will appear also later. I would like to uh, indulge a bit more on algebraic properties of this classical Jan-Baxter equation, both because uh, this fact is very nice. It's a very nice mathematical fact on its own, but also because it will play a role later on some physical calculation that I will want to do. Yes. Uh, it's probably a silly question. Uh, before you had a commutator of T1, T2 equals to T2, that was the Jordanian case. Uh, could you have just T1 and T2 give you some T3, which was not part of your R, or that's just not possible? No, you always want uh, R. Uh, to be of even rank because of this anti-symmetry property. And then uh, you can show that, uh, well, first of all, um, essentially this will imply that uh, R will be constructed out of 
an even number of generators. But it has to, to be a subalgebra, this, this. Yes, because uh, one can show that the classical max equation implies that the image of R is a subalgebra of F. That's clear because here I have an R of a certain X commutator with R of a certain Y, it must be in the image of R again. Uh -huh. So the image of R closes into a subalgebra of F. It must be even rank. And then, yeah. Okay. So you can have rank four, so you can have four generators and maybe three of them can close in, in, in a non-abelian uh, subalgebra, but you must have at least uh, an additional commuting uh, U1 to do something. Thanks. But actually the, the, the case you mentioned uh, works precisely in this way. So you can have this Eisenberg algebra, which is three-dimensional, but you add the U1 and then you can construct a non-abelian R matrix on this algebra. Other questions? Good. So I was going to explain this uh, uh, mathematical feature of the classic and Baxter equation, which uh, will play an important role also later. So there's a way to restrict the domain of my R operator in such a way that I can properly define an inverse of this R. So let's suppose that uh, we are doing this. Again, I'm skipping some details. Um, and let's call omega the inverse of R. It turns out that if R solves the classical and Baxter equation that I'm copying here again, then omega will solve a linear condition. You can probably see it uh, uh, by manipulating in your head uh, this equation. And the equation that you obtain turns out to be the two cycle condition. So this two cycle condition is an equation that appears in mathematics when you want to construct uh, central extensions of Lie algebras. You probably saw it uh, written in this way, because when an omega satisfies this condition, then the central extended Lie algebra satisfies the Jacob identity, okay? So this is a very nice connection between classic and Baxter and two cycle condition that is already nice from the mathematical point of view, but I stress that later it will be important to do some physics calculations. So please keep, in, keep it in mind. But before going there, let's... Uh, now explain what I promised, uh, meaning that uh, this uh, deformation is integrable. I will uh, only uh, focus on the fact that I can construct a lax connection. And well, the story works rather similarly to what you have in the undeformed case of the principal current model, because there you have two equations. The first one are the equations of motion. They read like the conservation of the current J tilde. And because this J tilde is taken to be of Mare Cartan form, it also satisfies an equation of shell. This is an identity, the Mare Cartan identity. And the combination of these two equations is enough to conclude that we can construct a lux connection like this with a spectral parameter Z that is flat in this sense on these equations. So for Jan Baxter, it is similar. You can still uh, write the equations of motion as the conservation of a sort of current. Now I call it A. And it's actually a modified current because you take the Mare Cartan form and you act on it with this uh, operator depending on R. Because you have this modified current, you should not expect in general that it satisfies the Mare Cartan identity. It's not of Mare Cartan form, but it turns out that it does satisfy the equation that you want if you require three things. First of all, if you are on shell, so if you also impose at the same time uh, the equations of motion, and then if you require that R is anti-symmetric and solves the classic and baxter equation. So this is where integrability enters because now formally we have the, the very same equations that we had in the case of the principal current model. Therefore, we know how to construct a lax connection that uh, gives us this uh, on-shell system of equations. And that's it, we have lax integrability. And even more because the form of the lax connections of the two models is the same, we can really equate them. So I will have this relation, J tilde is equal to A, that will be a map between solutions of the equations of motion of one model and the other. As in the case of the TST deformations that I explained before, um, well, this on shell equivalence will imply that at least on one of the two sides, you will have twisted boundary conditions. And one way to see it 
is to relate the degrees of freedom of this Jan Baxter model that I call G to the ones of the principal current model, G tilde, by an element of the Lie group that I call F, the twist field, because then imposing this on shell equivalence condition, J tilde is equal to A, I obtain a differential equation for F that reads like this, and we know how to solve this. It's given by this quarter order exponential. And then if you impose periodic boundary conditions for Jan Baxter, which is our assumption, you follow this chain of identities and you conclude that G tilde must uh, have a left twist W precisely as I was writing one of my initial slides where W now is given in, in terms of F in this way. So this is an argument that shows that you must have twisted boundary conditions. But unfortunately, this formula for the twist W or even the twist field F is not very useful to work uh, in practice because of no localities that uh, are introduced by this path order exponential. Yes. In the target space, if I think in uh, geometry parts, understanding of what, like in in terms of geometry of of what which so, uh, ingredient. So I, I am thinking that I'm in the target space. Okay. Let's uh, say we're doing green Schwartz formalism. Can I write v in a nice geometric way? V. Yeah. This v. Yeah. Uh, this particular object, uh, I don't know if it can have a geometric interpretation. In general, these deformations. I mean, you can obtain a different metric and you can try to embed it in uh, higher dimensions and plot it. Uh, I did the exercise at some point for a particular deformation and uh, you find that uh, the original round uh, uh, ADS or round sphere are squashed. Uh, but this particular object, I don't know if it has an interpretation. There's another question. Thanks. So uh, this twist, uh, uh, does it depend on the field G? So that's a field dependent twist. Yes, right? correct. It's uh, what I was saying at the beginning, that the twist depends on uh, conserved charges. So I will write conserved charges okay. as integrals of my fields. So okay, so you know that the dependence is just via the conserved charges because it wasn't uh, entirely apparent for, for Say again. It wasn't entirely apparent uh, to me that it is just via the conserved charges, nothing else. Uh, yeah, so as, a, as, I will show in, uh, as I will show you in a moment, it is possible to rewrite this W in a different way. And uh, one point is that here we are writing uh, the twist in terms of the fields, in terms of the degrees of freedom of the other model, the Jan Baxter deformation. And that's unnatural. And it turns out that this is actually the reason why we have these complicated no localities. If you try to rewrite the twist in terms of the degrees of freedom of the principal current model itself, then you find nicer formulas and uh, formulas that allow you to, to work with that. So we'll show you in a moment. So to follow up on Ellie's question, isn't V an element of the Lie algebra? Sure. So it's just, I guess that you can interpret it just as, you know, some tangent something, right? That's, yeah, that's, a, that's the most that you can, I mean, I, no. I don't know. This is, uh, you see, it has worksheet indices, B plus, B minus. So I don't know mm -hmm. if it makes sense to give it a target space interpretation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, maybe a little bit more. Yes. Like if we have the squashed sphere, for example, what V is for the squashed sphere? I don't know. Uh, it, it will depend on uh, your choice of R. Because you see, it's just uh, the image under R of this object. Uh, so this is this A, it was written before, is this uh, modified current, and then you act on it uh, with this uh, agile action by G. And then, so you can certainly look at it, but I wouldn't know if it has a target space interpretation that uh, is useful. Okay. So let's finally come to this rewriting of the twist that uh, uh, we mentioned. As I said, the, um, the key was to rewrite everything in terms of the correct degrees of freedom, G tilde. So you can take the previous differential equation 
uh, and you obtain this. So you find something that uh, is actually very non-standard and uh, at first sight is not uh, uh, known how to solve it. But now uh, comes the information that uh, there's a way to invert this R operator and introduce this Tuco cycle. So when you do that, you can uh, massage this equation and uh, arrive to an equation that I write here in the box, which is nice because what you have achieved at this point is separation of variables in the sense that the left-hand side only depends on my uh, twist field F and the right-hand side only depends on my uh, G tilde, the degrees, the degrees of freedom of the principal Kara model. So at this point, the task is to invert this relation and write uh, F as a functional of G tilde. And well, uh, this equation is still very complicated. It's not uh, clear how to solve it, but it is possible to solve it uh, in the following way. So first of all, I want to parameterize F as the exponential of R acting on an element of the Lie algebra that I call capital X. And then I further relate X to another element of the Lie algebra that I call Y through this relation. You see that this is a complicated relation. It's highly nonlinear, but it's completely local. There are no, uh, no localities involved. And actually it should also remind you of the formula that you obtain when uh, you want to compute the derivative of the exponential map. And the analogy actually goes quite deep because uh, the fact that omega satisfies the two condition implies that it is a derivative for the Lie bracket. So uh, the connection there uh, is quite strong. At the end of the day, anyway, I want to take this definition for y because if I compute the derivative of y and I use the two cycle condition, I can prove that what I get is precisely the left hand side of the equation that I want to solve. And if the derivative of y is equal to the left hand side, then y itself will be the integral of whatever I have on the right hand side. So even if these are uh, technical details, but of course this was the, uh, the core of the paper, the main message is that it's possible to write uh, an explicit expression for my twist W. Remember it was uh, written in terms of F in this way. And then F can be written in terms of X. If, uh, if I can invert this relation, I can write X in terms of Y and then Y in terms of G tilde. So I have an explicit expression. As you already mentioned at the beginning, W is constant. So W will be, will be written in terms of conserved charges of your model. So let me show you an explicit example in which you can uh, use these formulas. And let's look at the Jordanian deformation that I introduced before. So I have these uh, generators that I call T plus and T zero in this case. I can parameterize my Lie algebra elements that I was calling X and Y in an explicit way. And because I'm choosing an explicit R matrix, I can also invert the relation that I had in my previous slide. And if you do the exercise, you find uh, this formula. And then using this, you can construct a twist for the Jordanian deformation. It is the exponential of something that I call a capital Q times T zero minus small Q T plus. So this big Q and small Q are conserved charges of the model. And there's a way to write them explicitly in terms of the degrees of freedom of the twisted principal Kara model. Now, something I want to emphasize is that uh, this exercise of rewriting the Yambax deformation as a twisted uh, undeformed model is not just a nice uh, mathematical exercise, but it's actually crucial if you want to do, extract some physical calculations because working in the language of the Yambax deformation, uh, especially if you want to construct a monotony matrix, for example, is quite complicated because you have uh, no local expressions that you don't know how to, how to use, as we saw before. While in this twisted language, uh, you can use some tricks that uh, were working in the undeformed and periodic case. For, for example, uh, what you want to do is to expand the monodromy matrix around some special points. In this case, Z is equal to zero. And then what you want to do is to implement a um, gauge transformation of the Lux connection like this, and then you find nice formulas 
that at leading order expand in a nice way with some uh, local integrals. So in the periodic case, you would do this computation and W would be one. And then what you would need to do if you wanted to compute the eigenvalues of the monodromy matrix would be to compute the eigenvalues of the thing in black. In the presence of the twist, you have to multiply by an overall W inverse, and then the eigenvalues will be influenced by the particular W that you're choosing. And in particular, you see this is changing the asymptotics of the eigenvalues themselves. Normally they are non-trivial at order Z. Now they start to be non-trivial at order Z to the zero because they uh, match with the eigenvalues of, uh, of the twist. I will not uh, obviously repeat all the construction of the classical spectral curve. The, the message is just that uh, it works uh, essentially like in, in the undeformed and periodic case. The only thing that changes is uh, the asymptotic of the eigenvalues of the monodromy matrix that you have to specify at certain points like z is equal to zero or equivalently of the so-called quasi-momenta that are the, the logs of the eigenvalues. So as I said before, uh, one of my motivations is ADCFT. So we, have, uh, we consider the particular Jordanian deformation of ADS5S5, uh, one that happens to uh, preserve 12 of the original super isometries. And we apply this uh, ma machinery and uh, we constructed the classical spectral curve. Here, I just want to flash the quasi-momenta in ADS that you would find in the case of the deformation or the twist to compare them to what you would have in the standard uh, undeformed and periodic case. In both cases, they are labeled by three charges, but now in the twisted case, one of the charges that appear is this big Q, which was appearing in the, in the twist. And another comment is that the energy that uh, you compute here um, corresponds to a generator of time translations that does not correspond to the one of BMN. And this is not surprising because the particular R operator that you consider or the particular twist that it corresponds to, they do not commute with this BMN uh, translation. So you have to look for a different uh, notion of time in a sense. Another thing we did in the paper was actually to go a step further to consider semi-classical corrections to this classical spectral curve. We did that by using this uh, nice method developed by Gromov and Vieira, where they consider the classical quasi-momenta, they perturb them with some delta P, some uh, quantum fluctuations that encode uh, yeah, the quantum excitations. And the nice thing is that uh, these delta P's can be fixed uh, uniquely simply by some consistent consistency conditions at the level of the classical spectral curve itself. And then, well, we apply this method to a particular solution that we call the BMN-like solution. So a, a solution of the sigma model equation of motion. Uh, we call it like this simply because in the picture of the Yambaxa deformation, it is point-like and we obtain our results. The only result that I want to emphasize uh, and highlight at this point uh, is the fact that uh, in principle, you could have uh, semi-classical corrections for all charges, including this charge that appear in the twist, but it turns out that uh, uh, this is zero. And this is intriguing because, well, if uh, quantum corrections for the twist uh, were always vanishing, uh, it would probably signify that uh, the quantum description of the twisted model would be simpler. Now, uh, let me come to my conclusions. Today I told you about uh, this family of the ambassador deformations, and I hope I convinced you that uh, rather than working in terms of the deformed language, it's nicer to work in terms of the equivalent twisted model. For example, this twist uh, is highly non-local if we try to write it in terms of the degrees of freedom of the Jan Baxter model. And given that this twist is uh, one of the ingredients that enter the classical spectral curve, if you want, this is an example in which uh, hidden symmetries play an important uh, role in uh, integrable models. Now, if uh, let me focus uh, on a couple of comments for these Jordanian deformations. I mentioned this 
absence of quantum corrections for this charge capital Q that appears in the twist of the Jordanian uh, of the Jordanian case. It would be very interesting to understand whether this is just an accident of the particular BMN solution that uh, we are considering, or whether this is true uh, more in general. In that case, uh, it would be uh, interesting and useful. You probably remember that the twist for the Jordanian deformation was depending on two charges that I called uh, big Q and small Q, but only the big Q was entering the classical spectral curve. So one way to understand why the small Q was not playing a role is this. Uh, so you can rewrite W in this factorized way. And if you remember what I said regarding the story of the adjoint orbits, you see that you can uh, remove the dependence on the small Q and it's only the big Q that plays any physical role in the construction. And there's an important uh, comment that uh, I want to make related to this uh, factorization property. And that is uh, this factorization works in the same way for two different variants of the Jordanian deformation. And these two different variants are actually quite different because one of them corresponds to a deformation that gives rise to a solution of the supergravity equation of motion, while the second one to something that does not solve the supergravity equation of motion. So this is quite striking because these factorization arguments allows you to conclude that certainly at the classical level, the two models have the same spectrum, but then using this um, um, method of uh, Gromov and Vieira suggests that uh, perhaps this should all hold uh, at least also at one loop. But this is still an open question whether uh, it makes sense to talk about spectral equivalence of these two different uh, deformations. And it would be very interesting to understand that. I would like to mention that uh, there are really thousands of uh, interesting uh, uh, facts about the Maxa deformations uh, that one could study. Uh, here I want to uh, list uh, just a few of them that I find particularly interesting. Um, first of all, uh, you can understand these Yamaxa deformations as an interpolation between the parent model you start with, for example, the principal Kara model, and uh, its non abelian dual And this story is actually related to the fact that these deformed models enjoy some hidden Poisson Lee symmetries, and the deformation itself can be understood as a generalization of Poisson Lee duality transformations. So it's actually this relation to Poisson Lee duality that allows you to connect, uh, for example, to the construction of uh, integrable models from uh, for Dich and Simon's theory, and also to other topics of uh, theoretical physics uh, that are maybe not necessarily familiar to this kind of audience, like uh, generalized geometry and double field theory. So this is something I personally find very interesting. But going back to integrability, if we want uh, really to hope to extend these methods of integrability for this class of uh, Yambaxa deformations uh, applied uh, to the ADSFT correspondence, I believe there are a number of challenges that we still need to understand properly. And the main challenge for me is the understanding of the deformations that break these BMN isometries, because in this case, you simply cannot work with the original BMN solution and study fluctuations around it. Um, in general, you probably want to look for alternatives to the BMN solution. And then a number of questions arise. For example, you still probably want to make sure that you have a massive spectrum. And then you probably want to wonder whether the, the fact that you are deforming your model and then choosing a particular vacuum whether it still allows for enough symmetries to fix your S matrix, and so on and so forth. These Yambaxa deformations uh, are conjectured to uh, correspond to Dreamfeld twists at the level of the Hopf algebra. And actually, this proposal uh, has some important puzzles precisely related to the deformations that break BMN isometries, because if you have a classical twist that is breaking this BMN, you will need to look for a Dreamfeld twist uh, that is somehow not compatible with the vacuum of your spin chain. And that's something I, I don't know what it means. Um, 
I also mentioned at the beginning the possibility of non-diagonalizable non twists. So I refer to this paper for the study of one particular example in the, pos in the simplest possible setup. And then of course, even though I only talked about the story from the point of view of the string sigma model, it would be interesting to make a connection, for example, constructing twisted spin chains that should be somehow the ADCFT dual to these uh, deformations of the string sigma model. And that should somehow be derived by some deformations of any equal source of VMEs that still need to be constructed properly. And with this, I thank you for your attention. So you described these deformed models in terms of this twist. Uh, and I can see that on the level of the spectrum that may, may match, but what about if you multiply two such operators together, wouldn't you produce also states with double the twist or? Which operators? I mean, suppose you multiply two operators. I mean, you think of this, the classical solutions as being described by an operator in your Sigma model. Okay. And you look at the OPE of two such operators. So if one has twist the W and the other one has twist W, wouldn't you expect the product to have twist, roughly speaking, W squared, or at least not necessarily W again? So I don't know you... how it works in that context, but uh, I can tell you, for example, how it works uh, at the level of the construction of the spin chain of n equals force of PMEs for some simplified setup, which is, if you want a particular example of this, it would. It is the beta deformation of n equals source of PM means. So there you have two possible pictures. One of them is that you have um, a deformed spin chain where you have a really deformed Hamiltonian, but then you can do again a change of variables in the spin chain and you rewrite it as a twisted spin chain. So you have the undeformed Hamiltonian with twisted boundary conditions. And uh, well, yeah. I, I don't know how to answer your question. You probably want to go to the quantum level uh, with your with your question. Maybe can I just so if you have, I mean, it's, the twist depends on the conserved charges, right? So if you take one twist with one set of conserved charges, the other twist with the other set, and you'd get the conserved charges of the of the bound. I don't know, maybe. Um, yeah, I just wanted to understand a bit better. Um, so you have this nice picture with the twist at the classical level, and then there is this story that you mentioned here with the quantum uh, twist of the S matrix and Dreamfeld twist. So what exactly uh, are the issues that prevent you from saying, oh, let's just promote the classical twist to the quantum level and just call it a day and that's my quantum model? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, this uh, classical twist is an element of your uh, if you want the group of, of isometry, so let's take PSU224 if we want to consider it as 5 as 5. So in general, this W is an element of the, the, the supergroup uh, PSU224. But when you construct the all loop S matrix, uh, you know, you choose the BMM vacuum that is breaking PSU224 to two copies of uh, SU2 slash 2 centrally extended. And the S matrix is only invariant under this reduced uh, symmetry. And then I, I guess that it's natural to construct the Dreamfeld twists that are compatible with this symmetry that somehow come from this, uh, uh, this symmetry algebra. So this would be the one that commute with the BMN. And they are the ones that commute with the uh, BMN isometries. But as soon as you have a classical twist that is incompatible with BMN, it will not commute with this uh, SU2 slash 2 squared. And then uh, I wouldn't know how to construct the corresponding. And wasn't there some recent work by Stein van Tonger and, and uh, I forgot the name of the collaborator on uh, these things? Uh, maybe consider, in the context uh, of TST, not in the context of uh, of Jorgenian twist, but basically uh, some way of implementing in terms of shifts of the mo of the worship momentum. Uh, yeah. uh, maybe somebody that knows it better can comment, but no, I, I have so... some recollection. Stein van Tongeren and uh, his student Yannick Zimmerman, he studied the paper. Um, they consider TST deformations, so just abelian deformations. And if I'm not wrong, they consider uh, diagonal TST. Is that correct? Yeah, they consider diagonal TST deformations. So the simplest possible setup. 
they are diagonalizable and they are implemented by some Cartan charges. And in particular, if you restrict only to the sphere, you get uh, this uh, generic gamma deformation, the generalization of beta. In ADS, you can uh, do something quite uh, non-trivial. And there's one particular TST deformation that uh, they consider that involves also some shifts of uh, the worksheet momenta. And that's understood in the sense that uh, um, the cartan that uh, they use to generate the deformation or the twist is one of these uh, BMN uh, uh, generators. But you want to do positive roots or not? not, not Say just, again? The issue is that you want to do positive roots or something that is not just cartons, I think. Well, I would like to understand something that is not uh, of the TST class mm -hmm. because we already know a lot about TST. I would like to see some non-abelianity. Let me mention that uh, uh, there's actually uh, one of these examples that uh, Stein and uh, Yanni consider that is quite puzzling because it doesn't completely fit into this uh, picture of Greenfield twists, even though it's just TST. But it's still not completely understood why. Okay. Just an Eve question. Um, you always have close string boundary conditions on your sigma model, right? Just because I, I like to work with the closed strings and because I, I want to uh, really look at the deformation of my ADCFT integrable model. Yes. So I want to be able to switch on a deformation parameter and deform whatever story I had before. I agree yes. that in principle you could use different boundary conditions. Yeah, I mean, what I talked about, for instance, is integrable boundary conditions for open strings and you could of see... Course. Uh, what happens to your various deformations? And yeah, I, I is think it it's technically very, very hard or? It's probably very hard. I think uh, in some simplified setups, uh, th there was some study of alternative, uh, like open stain boundary conditions for uh, these integrable deformations. Certainly in the case of uh, the lambda deformation, so Sibylle uh, Driesen was uh, one of the people uh, who, who did that. Um, yeah, my, my answer is that um, um, the first natural thing to, to look at for me is the case of closed string. And because I'm still not uh, done with that, um, I think, uh, yeah, yes, that's okay. why so far I've not considered that. Mm, but so I think it's a very interesting question. And of course, uh, it's natural to, to look at it. Uh, I have a question about algebraic structure. Uh, I, I thought the young boxer deformation is like Q deformation, like XXF going to XXZ. But if you uh, find it equivalent to twist, then what, what happens to the algebra? Oh, okay, good. So um, this is related to the comment that I was making here. So there's a clash of terminology. There are two kinds of young boxer deformations. One is called the homogeneous young boxer deformation, is the one that I'm considering here. And another, and, and it corresponds to a twist at the level of the integrable model. And then there's another kind of Yamaxa deformation called inhomogeneous. It's not necessarily standard ter terminology for everybody, but this is the terminology I use here so that uh, we can understand each other. So in that case, R does not solve this equation. It solves an equation that is quite similar, but on the right hand side, we have the commutator of X and Y. And you're correct in that case. Uh, the deformation corresponds to a quantum deformation. And there's a very long story. There were, there were many people, uh, including Ben and uh, other people in the room who uh, looked at the construction of this uh, integrable model, or that if you want the deformation of the all loopes matrix uh, when you uh, construct a quantum deformation. And you can go very far because you have an all loopes matrix, you can construct a TBA, and I believe a quantum spectral curve was constructed or maybe not. Yes, I think Stein, yeah, Stein constructed that. But uh, it's a very similar kind of deformation. If you look at the uh, construction of the Sigma model action, because it's precisely this. The only, th uh, the only ingredient that changes is that uh, R should satisfy the modified classic IMAX equation. But then the physical interpretation is completely different. Uh, so in inhomogeneous case, uh, in which stage your argument breaks down? 
which argument? Uh, the fact that uh, it's not a twist? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I cannot apply uh, this uh, machinery and uh, there's no correspondence between uh, solutions of the classic and Baxter equation and Tuco cycles. Uh, another thing that changes, so perhaps what I'm going to say is not completely true at the level of the principal current model, but uh, it should be true uh, for cost and super cost. The form of the lax connection changes because as soon as you deform it, you have um, the projections of the lax connection on this Z4 graded subspaces are rescaled by some eta dependent coefficients. So you cannot have any more this sort of on shell equivalence. And well, there are various reasons. So for, first of all, um, the group of uh, Del Duque, Magro, Vicedo, uh, they extended this construction of clean cheek for the inhomogeneous and maxed deformation to the case of coset and super cosset at the Hamiltonian level. And the way they did it there was to realize that you can have two different Poisson structures that are compatible. So you have the, your original Poisson structure, but you are able to construct another one. And they are compatible in the sense that if you construct a linear combination of them, uh, then it's still a good Poisson structure. And then if you keep this deformation parameter and you study the model at the Hamiltonian level, it corresponds to this, uh, um, to this inhomogeneous and maxed deformation. So because you're really deforming the Poisson structure, uh, it's not just a twist. And then another thing that you can do is to com really construct uh, the conserved charges and see what is the algebra that they, under which they close when you compute Poisson brackets. And they did this calculation explicitly. It's very nice. And they see that it closes into what is, if you want, the classical counterpart of the quantum group deformation. You have these exponentials of uh, charges. Um, just to understand better, uh, so the, the key point here is on shell equivalence. So you're really discussing one sigma model, classic, classical sigma model, and another classical sigma model. Correct. And you are saying that they are related by some non-local field redefinition, which Correct. changes boundary conditions. Now, suppose we consider this model on a plane. Ignore boundary conditions. On a plane assume. in the worship. Yeah. yeah. So, and the question would be, uh, I pick up some vacuum in one model, in the original model, for example, long string or BMN vacuum, and compute a world as matrix, and ask you, would you expect it will be equivalent to a matrix computed in this other model where you do field redefinition? And uh, the normal intuition would be it's not because like in usual field theory, uh, redefinitions which preserve as matrix uh, satisfy certain conditions. So a priori is not clear why that will happen. So as matrix may not be equivalent. Uh, though the vacuum will be mapped to some other vacuum and uh, uh, the map depends on eta, so there will be dependence on eta through this map, but I still I don't quite see what this on shell equivalence will translate into. At the level of the S1. Yeah, at the level yeah, of... Uh, uh, if it was the same question I have. But yeah, the only thing I know is what happens in the case of uh, TST of the beta deformation. If I want to try to go beyond that, I don't know, because all other kinds of... Um, so as soon as I want to have a non-abelian uh, deformation, I have to go to ADS. I, I mean, I have to deform ADS non-trivially and then I will break these BMN isometries and then I cannot choose the same vacuum anymore. And the story, the naive story completely breaks apart. And yeah, I, I still don't this, know how this to- This is an, an interesting question, which maybe- Of course, yeah, I think it's the main question. If you, if you really want to extend this, uh, program of worksheet scattering to these uh, different models. Yeah. Can okay. I yeah. ask a question? Um, can you just say a bit more about, um, so this uh, Gromov-Diero method, semi-classical spectral curve story, um, 
where does the uh, the fact that this is string theory come in to all this? Uh, so the fact that you, I'm just wondering about this. You say that if you add this fermionic tail, which gives you the unimodular R matrix, it gives you the same one loop corrections. Somehow that the difference between unimodular and non-unimodular is somehow the quantum level something to do with Birazora, something to do with viral invariance. And I'm just wondering where that appears in this semi-classics. No, so first of all, this uh, method of Gromov and Vieira is um, it's very nice, but um, because it's so powerful, it's uh, difficult probably to see what could go wrong. And uh, as I said, the only ingredients that enter are essentially the classical spectral curve itself. You don't need anything else. Everything is fixed starting from that. So if you have two models that share the same classical spectral curve, uh, you will have. But um, something I didn't say, and that could be a way out to this strange possibility of having a spectral equivalence between uh, this uh, Sugra and non-Sugra solution is the following. Um, I, I explained that these Jan-Baxter deformations are classically on shell equivalent to these twisted models. So I go from the Jan-Baxter deformation to the twisted model. I have two possible versions of twisted models, and certainly uh, they have the same spectrum between each other, these two variants. They share the same spectrum at the classical level. Perhaps they also have the same spectrum at one loop. Let's suppose that uh, this is true. It's not obvious that at one loop, these twisted models will still correspond, both of them will still correspond to the unimodular and non-unimodular Yambaxa deformations. It could be that something goes wrong in particular in the non-unimodular case because you have some breaking of violent variance or whatever. So that's a possibility that uh, would somehow resolve this uh, very strange uh, very strange possibility otherwise. Okay, if there is one more question, we can take it. No? Uh, okay, then let's thank the Ricardo again.